Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and as always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. Jay, good morning. Before we get anywhere, you got some big news to announce here. As in, your morning coffee is expanding. Yeah. Well, thank you for the plug. Yeah, um, we we launched our very first podcast of your morning coffee. And if you don't subscribe to your morning coffee, it's a weekly newsletter. It's music news. I think it's free. I think you dig it, but yeah, thank you, Michael. We, we launched our very first one and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's funny because people have sent me these notes like, well, are you still going to do, you know, music biz weekly with Michael? And I said, yeah, of course I am. You know, I just want to do it's, more. It's, it's two, it's, it's kind of two different things, right? I mean, your morning coffee is like, tuning in for your morning news. That's right. It's a, it's a highly curated look at stories and we're speaking to somebody. Whereas what you and I do is really more about helping DIY folks and engaging in conversations with interesting guests like we have today. It's, it's apples and chainsaws. Apples and chainsaws. There you go. So, so where, where can people subscribe or listen to your morning coffee? Go to, I can't believe I got this URL, go to yourmorning.coffee. I I never knew that there was a dot coffee domain. I didn't either until I started searching on it. What country country is that associated to? I think it's U.S. Really? Yeah, yourmorning.coffee. Check it out. We've only got one episode. It was last week, and we're just now getting up on you know, cause as you know, all too well, it takes a hot minute for approvals and, you know, for Apple and Spotify yep. and, and everybody. And so, you know, we're just doing this kind of soft launch last week and it's, it's coming up, but uh, yeah, I was looking at yourmorningcoffee.com and all of these things that are taken and they wanted thousands of dollars for, and then just for giggles, I typed in yourmorning.coffee and it's like, yep, that's available. So I'm like, boom, I got it. That's a that's a killer domain to have just for probably future resale value. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You'll you, yeah, you, you pro- you'll probably make more money selling your domain in ten years than the than the podcast <laughs> than the will podcast. generate. Exactly, right. it's a labor of love, like uh, like a lot of things we do. Um, I was just going to say, is, is is the UPS guy there? Um, yeah, somebody came and dropped off a package. Yeah, you could, could you hear Apollo in the background? Yep, yep right. exactly. I could, right. I could hear the great security dog. <laughs> yeah, he's a gentle giant. If you came here with a pound of bacon, you could take anything in the house. I probably shouldn't say that, but he's big and he's scary, but he's a he's a gentle giant. Yeah, pets are the best. Yeah. Um, all right, so before we get to this week's guest, uh, thank you to Hypebot and Bands in Town. We We always week in and week out appreciate all your support and uh of course to our sponsors bandzoogle.com built by musicians for musicians bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to build a beautiful website and epk for your music bandzoogle powers the websites for tens of thousands of musicians around the world from weekend warriors to grammy winners All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, including hosting and a custom domain name. I wonder if they got .coffee. (laughs) I bet they do. By the way, my site is through Banzoogle. Is it? Sweet. Um, Dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters, social media integrations, of course, and amazing live tech support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. So we put together a great offer with Banzoogle. Uh, Head over to Banzoogle.com, try it for 30 days for free. And when you register, use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY, all one word, MUSICBIZWEEKLY, and you will get 15% off the first year of any subscription to their website. Nice. And I, I wanted to make a quick mention here because I've heard from other artists, you, a lot of these tools like commission-free crowdfunding and stuff like that, you can use your own website and still subscribe and just use those features. 
That's right. You don't have to transfer your entire website over to Banzoogle. So just yeah. keep that in mind. I mean, yes, it's great all in one, but if you've had a website for 20 years and you don't want to move it and you've got no problem with it, but you want you can still crowdfunding where that. you don't yeah. have to pay a commission, you can still use those tools over at Banzoogle. Um, and of course, discmakers.com. We know it's a digital world, but there's still an important role for physical media for today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments are so small, it's selling products like CDs, vinyl, t-shirts, online and at gigs. Sell it online through your Banzoogle website. Mm -hmm. Has become an important income generator. For every CD you sell at a gig, you might need roughly 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money, and that's a lot of streams. Our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs, other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. So we put together a cool little offer with Disc Makers for you. Head over to discmakers.com, place an order for 100 or more CDs, and when you check out, enter the promo code free biz f-r-e-e-b-i-z all one word and you will save up to a hundred and fifty dollars in shipping costs so discmakers.com promo code free biz so we got a great special guest this oh my week. gosh yeah it's such a great conversation um he he brought up so many things that are so timely uh and where we are today in this world and so much great advice lots of talk about diversity and team building and uh, leadership just a really great conversation yeah yeah we're, we're we're this week we're joined by tony alexander co-founder president managing director of made in memphis entertainment Oops. um a black owned full service music and entertainment company with global reach but with its heart in the hometown of modern american music build a stunning band website in minutes with Banzoogle. Go to Banzoogle.com to start your free 30-day trial and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. So Music Biz Weekly podcast listeners, we're honored today to be joined by Tony Alexander, co-founder, president, and managing director of Made in Memphis Entertainment, a black-owned, full-service music and entertainment company with global reach, but with its heart in the hometown of modern American music. Welcome, Tony. Oh, thank hey, Tony. you very much for having me, uh, Michael and Jay. I appreciate it. So yeah. you you are you're I'm I'm assuming you're in Memphis, right? That's correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, why don't you fill us in? You know, we we got a little bit of a a, a bio on you in advance here, um, and I love the fact that you know you can talk about making diversity a priority. In, in an entire C-suite. And for our listeners who don't know what C-suite means, it's all of the executives have C in their title. It's, it's, not, it's not a suite at an arena, <laughs> okay? Typically chief, right? Yeah, it's, right. it's CEO, COO, CMO, you know, all of those big C titles. Um, C suite. So talking about the diversity of the entire C suite rather than just hiring a chief diversity officer. And I think that's really interesting because, and, and you guys obviously jump in and comment, and this isn't just in relation to somebody hiring a chief diversity officer, but a lot of times you see these companies hiring a chief something and it just rings of PR. Like, right. you're like, is that really going to be a role that has active influence in your company's day-to-day -day operations? Or are you just filling a title with somebody so it looks good? Exactly. And then you're able to put out a press release. And typically in those situations, they're underfunded. Uh, they do not have the authority and the influence to make a difference. And so I do think it's broader than just in C-suites where you might bring in a chief um, diversity officer or a chief financial officer or whatever it might be. If you kind of think about it, even when uh, organizations are, are just forming, whether it's a, a publishing company or a label, uh, we find that a lot of creatives are not included when you go out and say, oh, uh, we have a brand new head of A&R. 
um, that may not be a creative and does not really understand the repertoire part of artist and repertoire. And so uh, it, it's interesting that in a lot of areas of business, uh, the people who know how to do it uh, may also be the ones that are least likely to have a voice in the conversation. Yeah, you know, it, and and I know from my my job history, I've worked in plenty of co corporations and businesses where I've fallen into that middle management role where you're a director, and and my opinion is that's the that middle area is where you find all that talent. That that's the people who are doing it day in day out, dealing the worker with bees. yeah the worker bees, and you're right a lot of times they don't have a voice to get up to that next well the c level is like two levels above you got to go from director to vp to c-suite i mean you know you, you you may never have an audience with anybody in the c-suite group and i feel like that's and that's a problem for companies it is a problem and so i think in a lot of ways that's why I tended to gravitate to non-hierarchical type environments. So even though I'm trained as an attorney and have spent uh, quite a bit of time in large, you know, probably your, your big law uh, type firms where you have maybe a thousand lawyers in the firm. So I've, I've worked in large law firms, but for most of my career, I've just been a serial entrepreneur. So between private practice and then going and getting involved in the startup, um, scaling and selling of businesses, what I, what I found is that by being able to be in a startup environment, you get a broader view of what's going on. Um, there, there are fewer seats between you and the senior executives. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's a real opportunity to get a full vision and contribute at a very meaningful level. So you're not compartmentalized, only being able to see your four walls, but you can actually see what the work you're doing, how it impacts uh, the business generally, and also the customers. Interesting. You know, there's a there's a saying in politics that you're either a, a workhorse or a show horse. And there's some folks that just get stuff done quietly behind the scenes, those workhorses, you know. And then there are the folks that sometimes get the headlines and, you know, it's like they have their own publicist. And I, I see that in, especially in the music business, you know, you know pretty quickly who the workhorses are. But the, the question I wanted to ask you, it, when you talk to women in the music industry, sometimes they'll tell you that women who reach a certain level of executive are actually hardened and they're tougher, especially on other women, which sounds counterintuitive, right? What's your um, take on? let's say people of color, when, when someone um, reaches a certain level of, you know, within the ranks of an executive, are they typically inclusive of other people of color or are they like this indictment, are they really tougher on people of color? I think that it's, it's actually a combination of both. Uh, because what, what happens a lot of times is that they're, they're tougher on, on other people of color because they know what it took for them to get to where they are. And so they want them to understand there are going to be some real obstacles ahead of you. Um, but what I've also found is that you, you have a situation where they've achieved a certain level of success. And because in many instances, they're the only uh, person of color in these boardrooms or in these uh, in the rarefied air and so as right, result, right. they're being second guessed on a regular basis and so they're they're very hesitant to take the risk of bringing another person of color into that environment if they're not thoroughly convinced uh, that this is a superstar they're not going to bring in a work in progress. They're not going to bring in somebody who needs some coaching and some mentoring. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to have to be completely refined or they're going to, uh, all things being equal, uh, defer to someone else just because they don't want to run the risk of their own reputation being tarnished by bringing in the wrong person of color. Because they're, under really an level. They're, they're, they're kind of under an extra magnifying glass, so yeah. to speak. That's, and right. that's not fair. That's not a level playing field because 
the, you know, the 50 year old white male, you know, like me can bring in another 50 year old white male and it doesn't have that scrutiny. Right. Well, you know, and it's interesting because that's a challenge that they face. And then smaller organizations like ours, uh, we face a slightly different challenge. I know that uh, during this climate, I have a lot of people say, well, you need to let everybody know, lead with the fact that you're a black owned business. And, and I can keep reminding them that in, even in the black circles uh, amongst the black community, being black isn't necessarily a selling point. Um, <laughs> because in, in a lot of ways, um, that causes some level of suspicion. Um, because this is a black owned business, is it run effectively? Uh, are they going to be able to get us the exposure that we're looking for? Will we get the same types of results? So what I have always said is that instead of trying to lead with that, uh, we want to lead with excellence. We want to make sure that whenever we deal with our clientele, customers, partners, uh, that they're going to walk away with two things. They're going to feel special and they're going to have uh, the experience of peace of mind. That if they're working with us, they know that whatever it is they've engaged us for is going to be done with excellence. And then secondarily, they're going to feel special. If they feel that and they experience that, uh, then we can say, and by the way, uh, we're a black business. Uh, but yeah. we're certainly not going to lead with it because that isn't always a calling card or a selling point. Right. You know, and, and, and to what I started off with, a lot of times the media, the people reading the media, and I, I don't want to throw the media under the bus for this by any means, will look at using that calling card again as you're just doing that for PR. Right. You know, and, and, and I love the fact that you said we want to lead with excellence. Exactly. You want to lead with the work you do, the quality of work you do. That's right. Well, when I think about this, I'm reminded of one of our colleagues who uh, recently passed away. Um, two, two and a half years ago, we acquired a songs catalog, a sync business called Heavy Hitters Music Group. And uh, it was led by Cindy Bedell Slaughter, who had spent a good bit of her career uh, at CBS. And then she and her husband, Bill, uh, uh, acquired the business probably 12 years ago, and, and they ran it very well. And this kind of speaks back to, to one of the things you were saying, Jay, about how women sometimes can be harder on women. She built an extraordinary team of women uh, at Heavy Hitters Music Group. Now, there, there are a couple men there, so I don't want to make it seem like <laughs> all women. Um, right. but she, she, because what she experienced in her career was that she had some of the best bosses that you could imagine, and the, she also had some of the worst. And so she distilled that experience into mentoring, and so she would first hire some amazing young ladies and then she would mentor them and give them opportunities and experiences and she would always say that i want to create an environment uh, for them to grow that i didn't have and so she really created an amazing environment and unfortunately she, she passed two weeks ago from mm -hmm. metastatic lung cancer but she um and, and we're going to continue to su support her legacy in some of the organizations that she supported but when we did our due diligence on that business, the financial due diligence didn't take long, um, but we spent so much time understanding her philosophy and how she uh, went about doing business because she was about excellence, but she was also about creating environments so that people could be um, their best selves, they can excel. And so it's the excellence internally that allows for there to be excellence externally towards the, uh, the customer. And so that's what we've tried to adopt throughout all of our businesses is to make sure that um, diversity is something that you actually actively have to engage in doing. And, and so you may not be able to find uh, a lot of people who may have all of this experience. I think you've seen those memes where it was a bunch of little kids wearing um, uh, firefighter, fi firefighter fighter outfits. They were like three years old with big hats mm -hmm. on and they, and they said they were looking for um, someone with 20 years of experience and yet most of the people that were applying were only 18. So it, so when, when were they going to get all of this? <laughs> right, right, right. right. And, and so you have to create environments where we're onboarding people who may not be fully formed 
and we're going to create within the organization the training culture to get them to where they want to go. So these might be second, second chance individuals. These might yeah. be people who everyone has, has kind of abandoned and, and, and kind of assumed could not be successful. And we've been able to see many of them on management tracks within our organization, and they've been some of the most extraordinary uh, people to work with. You know, that it's, is it's so important. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I, I was just going to sort of say the same thing. It is such a treat, especially when you're one of the employees, to find an executive slash company with that mentality, with that how that operation, um, because it is so nurturing. It helps you get better. It it brings out your strengths and your confidence as opposed to the executives and the companies that are all politics that, you know, it's just like, you don't have to have talent to get up to the VP level. You just know how to backstab and how to manipulate and how to take credit for other people. And, you know, and, and I've worked in both environments and let me tell you, when you get that great company, Wow, as an employee, the morale is so much better. Right. Because then there's everybody. a path, right? Yeah. Before that, there, there may not be a path. I was very fortunate. I worked at Universal for nearly 20 years. I had a mentor, this guy named Bob Schneiders. He was a big executive there, but he took me under his wing and basically taught me the ropes and taught me to think for myself. And then when I got my own team, I modeled my team after that. And we are still in contact, you know, 10, 15 years later, still talk all the time. It reminds me of this thing I saw uh, about doctors. And I know I'm going to butcher this, but you'll get it. <laughs> it was something like um, watch one, do one, teach one. So you watch, uh, you know, you watch somebody do an operation, then you do that operation, then you teach somebody that operation. And by teaching somebody something that you know, it also helps you to learn more about it and they may see it in a different way. But I think when it comes to mentoring, sometimes we get a little fearful of our jobs, maybe, uh, maybe there's some insecurities there, but the work environment that Michael's alluding to, man, if you can get somebody who's a mentor, who's inclusive and who doesn't have to take credit for anything that they don't do, that they love to show off their team, look what Michael did, right? That sort of thing. You know, look what Tony did. That's where you can flourish and grow. And I think it transcends um, race and gender if you're working with good people. That's exactly right. And, and I think that that's why we, we've been able to see the kind of diversity that we have because we've been going out trying to recruit people, not so much based on race, gender, or, or, or sexual orientation, or whatever it might be, we're looking for people who are passionate about people because when they want to serve people, you know, cause I remember uh, just readings uh, about the fact that um, people think that leadership um, and they use the term servant leadership a lot. And, and from my perspective, uh, there's no other type of leadership. Uh, if, if you're going to lead people, you have to love them or care about them enough to want to invest in them. If you're just stepping, if they're just stepping stones that you're just going to walk over in order to get to your accolades, your achievements, your credit, <laughs> you know, right. your, your, your little bit of attaboys, then you're not going to effectively create an environment um, that you or them can thrive in. But when you actually care about people, and this is why it's important, because if they care about each other, this is the employees, if they care about each other, they care about those that they manage, as well as those that manage them then they can't help but care about the customer because the customer is going to get that same kind of treatment that we care about you. We're not going to give you a cookie cutter solution. We're not going to do what we think you should do. We're going to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And then we will come up with a complementary uh, program. So when, I, when we, we think about environments and, and Michael, you, you're right on point with this is that when you come into an environment where it's refreshing that you're, you can put the knife away, um, uh, you don't have to stab yeah. people in the back. You don't, and, 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 and this is a conversation I even have with a lot of the team members is if you believe that you have to have um, your, your uh, CYA email or letter 
uh, <laughs> then you've already lost. Because anytime the relationship uh, requires you to put something away just in case I have to pull yeah. this out and prove this happened, then you're in an environment that is very toxic. So yeah. we, we want to have environments that are less toxic and we have to be willing uh, to understand people. I, I, just the other day, I'll just give this example and then we can move on. I, I just mentioned that someone said, well, can I get the resume for all the different people that are in your organization? And I, I just had to candidly say, we have, you know, it's not a huge organization. I think there's about 50 of us, 55. Um, only one person ever submitted a resume. We didn't hire based on resumes. Right. That's just not how we do things. Yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, and I don't want this to, to be a put down on getting a college education because I think it's very important, but I've always felt your college education and resume is important for that first job. Right. Because you got nothing other than maybe I worked at a bowling alley in a pizza place before that. So here's where I went to school. Here's what I studied. You know, that sort of stuff. Here's some references from some professors, whatever it might be. After that first job, the resume really becomes less and less important. It becomes your work experience. And and I tell people it's it's more your street experience than it is the book experience. Because 20 years down the road, you're doing stuff. I'm doing stuff now that didn't even exist when I was in college. So how could book experience ever teach it? It's yeah. street experience. Well, you know, if you kind of think about it, the, the entertainment industry probably has a lot more people who do not have your traditional education. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's, it's amazing because kind of how we ended up, that one of the reasons why we, we founded Made in Memphis Entertainment uh, had a lot to do with exactly what you just said, is that um, as we looked out, and, and so my, my co-founder and you know, Hall of Fame songwriter, David Porter, we got together and uh, we met and, and I actually served on the board of his nonprofit that after years he realized the city had been good to him uh the industry had been good to him let's give back and so he started a an organization called the consortium mmt for memphis music town and that organization uh was de designed to uh, train songwriters producers and recording artists and the thinking was that you would create these kinds of opportunities and then now Memphians could stay home and be able to have a wonderful career. What actually happened was these creatives got good training and then moved to Los Angeles, moved to uh, uh, New York, moved to Atlanta. And if it was gonna be closer, they moved to Nashville. And so a as a result, we realized that the problem wasn't just training, giving them the skills, but it was also opportunity. And so when we just describe Made in Memphis Entertainment and the family of companies that we operate, we really talk about the concept of being an alternative. And so when we think about what, what happened there, and, and then we coupled that also with the fact that around 2018, uh, they were celebrating the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, 50 years since the assassination in Memphis, Tennessee. And so there was a big celebration, uh, MLK 50, and you know, I, and pardon me because it, it did. It wasn't something that I was really excited about celebrating, because uh, you typically celebrate achievement, not the demise of an individual. Right. And so, if we look at the the data, it showed that we had seen some improvements in educational gains uh, between the races. So, uh, in in Memphis in 1968, the high school graduation rate for uh, blacks was very low. Uh, college education rates um, was very low. Uh, we've seen improvement over those 50 years, but economically it has not translated into um, uh, improvements in medium, median household income nor in net worth. In fact, uh, the average family in Memphis that's black uh, is essentially worse off financially in 2020 than it was in 1968. And so from our perspective, we were thinking, well, um, historically in the 
black community, entertainment had always been an opportunity to create wealth. And so if you look at it, and I'm thinking from, from my entrepreneurial standpoint, you give a laptop to somebody in Silicon Valley, and now you have the next Google, you have the next, uh, uh, you, you just name the company, right. and, and there you have it. Well, mm -hmm. what if you gave a laptop with, with Pro Tools or Logic on it to a kid in Memphis? Uh, what would you get? You might get the next Jay-Z. You might get the next uh, Kanye West. You may get the, the next um, um, sure. whoever you name. And so we thought that not only creating a viable business that gave alternatives, uh, but also create a business that was going to create economic opportunity. So we actively decided that as we went out to employ people, we were going to give uh, a look beyond what the resume might say. So we would not put out a job description saying college degree, X number of years of experience. We wanted to spend time sitting with people and understanding what made them tick. Uh, what was their drive like? Did they have a uh, hustle? Did they have grit? Um, these are the kinds of things that are more important uh, than where you went to school, um, what your degree was in, and whether or not you had years and years of experience. Because one thing I've learned about experience, if you're doing the uh, exact same thing over and over again for 20 years, you really don't have a breadth of experience. You, right. you, you pretty much have, have maybe carpal tunnel from repetitive. Got some problems. skills, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I was um, interviewing with a company, it was like 20 years ago, and it stuck with me to this day because it wasn't about the education or resume. They told me that the resume gets you in the door to have the conversation. They see that you're a serious person. But what I loved about this company is that they, they had candidates go and meet with the individual teams that they'd be working with to see if it was a good fit. Yes. And I thought that was really interesting because you spend so much of your time at work with your coworkers and you need to make sure that you fit and it had nothing to do with gay, straight, introvert, extrovert, white, black. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with fit. Are you the type of person that can, because we all have different personalities. Some people are just very bold and very loud and very, you know, gregarious. Others are a little bit more reserved and quiet and they wanted to make sure that that fit was in place. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that's extraordinary, Jay. And I, as I think about that, fit is important. And what I'm sure that organization meant by fit and what we mean by fit is not homogenous, but that you click. Because I know personally, I'm an introvert. And are we willing to come and give our all? There's certain, there's certain attributes uh, that we're looking for in people. And, uh, and so we have some values that we, we advocate for, like uh, initiative, accountability, the willingness yeah. to collaborate, and, and communication. Yeah, these are key yeah. things that are important to us. A lot of these other factors are less important, but if we know that somebody will, is willing to make a decision, uh, stand behind that decision, kind of give uh, feedback on how the decision has been playing out, and, and if it turned out that the decision was not the best decision, own it. Because uh, one thing about startups is that um, failure is part of the business. And so absolutely, you, you have to have mistakes, you have issues. And so you just understand that you give people environments and latitude to make mistakes, just make sure that you create an environment that's such that none of them are going to be fatal. Yeah. But I think we all learn more from our mistakes than we do from our successes, because we know what oh, we Oh yeah, do. 100%. I, I worked on a team and I, I'll bet you money that you two have both worked on a team like this that I look back on, this, this was my team at, uh, at Universal, and it was, it was just the best. And we're still friends, and we still talk, and we just had a moment in time, and we knew it was special at the time. We had this team. It was diverse. It was, it, and I'm not just talking about you know, race. I'm talking about introvert, extrovert, all of that stuff, the different personalities. But when you get that mix, you know, it's kind of like a band is better than a, a solo artist when it comes to like writing sometimes because you've got the input of all these other people to, to bring something better, to make it more inclusive and just better. And that team at Universal 
you know, because of the fact that we had all of these different views and people coming from different areas, it made it so powerful and so special. And I miss it to this day. And I'm hoping that, you know, I have a team later on that has that kind of magic. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that the, the thing that made it so amazing is that we weren't all male or female or white or black or gay or straight or any of that stuff. People came from these different areas and they, we valued everybody's input. It, when we were at a meeting, it was yes and not no. No, because it's so easy to kill an idea. It's so easy. We had a saying that um, it's always a stupid idea until somebody else does it, <laughs> right? So anyway, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I just think that that diversity isn't a weakness. It's a strength. Well, you know, and Jay, to, to, to piggyback on that, and I think we've probably all seen this, where there are organizations that attempt to put together these great teams. But the reality is what they put together is a bunch of people who all have MBAs. Right. That's not a diverse team. No. That, that's, a, that's a bunch of MBAs getting into a room because, you know, the, 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 op, the, the mindset of that corporation is, yeah, if, if you're an MBA, you must be an expert. Well, that's not the case anymore because as we've talked about, you can learn so much from the street, especially in the music industry. So many people get their experience not from a book, yeah. not from a, a classroom. They get their experience by volunteering to book a band, being yeah. a producer, you know, helping experience, out. Experience, real world experience. I would want an MBA on my team. Some of my best friends at Universal were MBAs and I learned a lot from them, but I'd also want somebody on my team that was an actual, someone who's done it. Yep. Have you written a song? Have you recorded a song? Have you engineered or produced a song? Have you ever toured? You know, that kind of experience is worth every bit as much as that MBA. And they're, they're both valuable but you can't have all of either. Right. It's funny because Jay, you know, we, we, we always talk every week. It's like, Oh, did you try out this new website service? Yeah. <laughs> right. I can't believe they released it this way. Did they even use their own yeah. tools? You know, did the developer actually is the developer actually a musician because no musician would ever use it in the way you released it. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's why they say that you should always taste the wine before the wine tasting. Ah. You have to make sure that, and, and so that's why diverse like that, teams yeah. work because they are the consumer base. And yep. so now you're getting that big built-in feedback right there within your organization. And yep. so it's important. And, and again, as Joy, Jay pointed out, it's, it's not the diversity uh, necessarily of race, gender, sexual orientation, diversity of ideas, Des diversity oh, of- I love that. Brain. Diversity, diversity of, of ideas. Uh, and and like I do that. think that in, in a lot of ways, it's easy for um, particularly introverts like myself who spend so much time in our own minds uh, that we, we believe we've looked at it from 50 different uh, <laughs> uh, vantage points. And so therefore, the answer we put forward is going to be right. Uh, but we still have to be open to the fact that somebody who ordinarily would not have been invited to the conversation uh, is going to come up with a an idea or a solution that would be much better than any of us who uh, have these preconceived notions, and that that's what my experience has been. Is that we've had we've had marketing discussions where uh, one of our um, uh, studio engineers had the best solution, just like we also had um, discussions around production it is amazing that the person who shouldn't have even been there is the one who has the right. best. I think that is so spot on. I don't know. I'm going to butcher this story, but please bear with me. Uh, Barry Gordy from Motown had this meeting where he would invite everybody in and it was the receptionist. It was the musicians. I mean, it was everybody was a part of this meeting and he would play a new single. And one of the questions would be, okay, You've got 99 cents and you're starving. Are you going to get the hot dog? Or are you going to get that song? And it's got to be that you're going to get that song, right? But the point of it was that it wasn't just 
the higher up executives sitting back going, you know what, I got this kid. It was like everybody had a voice. And I think that's so healthy in, in the music business and probably in any business. You invite that intern in that intern may see things a little bit different and maybe isn't so fearful of their job or the status quo or whatever it is. I, I think everybody should have a voice and that's where you get that true diversity. One thing that I've, I've learned by coming from other industries, whether it be my experience in medical devices, telecommunications, you know, just uh, in all these different areas in software development, is that in most other industries, there is a real process orientation and the voice of the customer is very important. Uh, the music industry is one of the few areas where you have heroes really happening in practice in successful um, entertainment companies where there is a committee of people who bring their diverse experiences to the table and they all come together and say, we all agree on this one. We agree on this mix or we agree on this. And that's the one that actually wins out. But, you know, we, I, I do think that there's a hero mentality that is, is yeah. in the industry where people want to be that a and R. I I discovered this person, I, 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 <laughs> when in reality, some of the most successful outcomes were a function of a collection of people weighing in and coming to a consensus around something that really took off. <laughs> I agree. I think everybody thinks they're Clive Davis, right? <laughs> and it's, and they're not. And I've been in this business a long time, but I can tell you that even that intern's opinion, you got, you got to listen because a lot of times they're a little bit more hip to what's happening with, you know, Michael and I will talk about these new platforms like, you know, Roblox or TikTok or wh whatever it is they're probably on there before you are and they probably get a sense of what's going on. And, you know, I think the most successful executives that I've worked with, and I've been fortunate enough to work with some of the top executives in the business is that they've asked, and this is shocking sometimes, what do you think? I'm like, what do I think? You're asking me what I think, you know, but that's very empowering. And it's, it's a, uh, it's a great burden to, to, you know, to hold and just to kind of put an exclamation point on what you what you're saying is i've been in those meetings when they're inclusive like that and when you're looking around the table going no i, I heard what you said michael what do you think mm -hmm. man you never forget that it's empowering and it's it's a very powerful then everybody instead of leaning back at the meeting pretty soon they're leaning forward yes. and they're going i got something i want to add to this and it it's a very powerful thing, but people in general are afraid of things they don't understand. They're afraid for their jobs these days, right? And their arms are crossed and they're kind of, you know, leaning back. But I get excited when I hear you talk about things like that because I remember those days, you know, in those meetings, you know, in that non-COVID world where you have those conversations and when it becomes inclusive, the room becomes electric. It's a whole different experience. You know, never, never forget David Geffen started in the mailroom. I mean, that, right. that intern could be the next Clive Davis in four years. And sometimes years. it is. And yeah. it, very well. So, you know, a education, a job title doesn't mean you actually know more and know better. Well, you know, Michael, one thing that I would say, because, uh, you know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, education is an important component of our business model. And so part of the reason we structured the business the way that we have is so that, um, so for example, um, Made in Memphis Entertainment is a parent company uh, that oversees operating businesses. And so we have recording studios in uh, Memphis and we're about to uh, open one in Atlanta. Uh, and so these recording studios are, are designed for a particular purpose. We know that people can record in their, in their bathroom if they would like, uh, but we created creative spaces to be able to have an opportunity for creatives to gather. And so in fact, our, our studio franchise is for you recording. So that we're sending the message to creatives, we built this for you. And then we have our label, um, Mime Records, which 
uh, David Porter oversees and, and spends a lot of time, you know, just working with emerging artists because he believes that we lost the art of artist development. Instead of signing somebody when they've already reached a point where they don't really need a major label deal, that's <laughs> when the major labels come in and, and sign them. So we're doing artist development. So these are people who do not have Instagram followers, don't have uh, all the socials, but yet talent they're getting cultivated and one day they will have the careers that they're looking for. So we, there's a long game with our studio. Then we have our digital distribution business. We do some physical, but most of what we do is digital distribution. Um, and then we have our publishing companies. We, the sync company that I talked about earlier and then more traditional uh, publishing business. And then we do some artist services in, as another entity. All of that plays together because much like um, Apple, when you go into the Apple store, uh, you, you wanna buy your new iPhone or you wanna buy your, your new uh, tablet, um, but they're also offering courses um, so that you can learn how to use certain software. You can right. uh, talk to a genius if you're having issues. And so we, we've kind of set up our studio model that way, is that you come into the recording studio, you record, um, and we're putting on a seminar on publishing so you understand some of the basics of publishing or we might have a seminar on um, some some aspects of the, the what, what labels do and what labels don't do. So we're educating creatives because the more educated they are, uh, the more they're going to actually be um, able to consume services in a, in a meaningful way. So for example, if they don't understand that a publisher isn't supposed, I mean, a um, distributor is not supposed to do the exact same thing as the label. Uh, they can then uh, select a, a, dis a distributor based on the distributor's attributes as opposed to signing with a distributor and getting angry because the distributor did not function as a label. Or right. alternatively, they go to a publishing company expecting the publisher to do certain things that the publisher is not going to do. And 100%. so educating and, and trying to understand that. So when they come into the studio and record, and then they learn some of these things, and then they have access to some of the other um, services that we provide, we're not going to force any of our services on them. We just want them to be an alternative. But we do want to educate them because um, the more educated they are, the better the consumer they're going to be. And so this is what I, I tell lawyers all the time. I'm more fearful of going up against an incompetent lawyer than I am going up against a skilled attorney because a skilled attorney <laughs> can operate within certain parameters. Right. And an right. incompetent one is going to be bumping off of the wall. They're going to do right. right. They're, they're, a, they're a wild card. They don't know the difference between really what a label does and what distribution does. Um, and there's so much education that Michael and I do week in and week out with clients and friends just to kind of help them understand what these things are it's no big mystery but you know my, my grandfather used to say that an idiot is someone who doesn't know what you just found out so you know part of it, part of being you know in a position where we are i think it's incumbent upon us to educate and train people and i'm thrilled that you're doing that because it's so important today because there's so much misinformation out there and and I say ignorance, but I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's just people need to educate themselves on what all of these different things, you know, like publishing and sync and touring. There's a lot to learn there. But if they have a resource like you and your team, just ask the questions. It's so important. Yeah, because we want people to not just parrot back the, the, the catchphrases. Own your masters. Control your publishing. Don't, right. don't, but what does that mean to them? Um, because at the end of the day, you can, you can own your masters, you can control your publishing, you can do all these things, but if you don't have any resources, you're going to have to have a conversation with somebody that is either going to take a revenue share, they're going to ask for a flat fee or something. No one is going to do anything for you for absolutely nothing. So That's as right. a result, if you're educated to know that owning your masters really is meaningless because with a lot of the people that you're talking to, they're not trying to take your masters. So, <laughs> so you just need to find yeah. out how are they going to be compensated? Um, but if you understand how the money flows and then, then that works, uh, understanding that this advance that you're getting is not free money. 
uh, that yeah. you're going to have to pay this money back. And the more advance you take, the greater the likelihood. The more you got to pay back. And That's so I right. think that a lot of people don't understand that they're entering into these contracts and they're so bitter. They believe that somehow they've been taken advantage of. But in reality, what, what's going on is they walked into something where it was hiding in plain sight exactly what was going on. And so we're trying to educate, and we know that in the near term, when you educate creatives, uh, it, it causes them to believe that, that you're probably not the best fit for them. And we're okay with that, because at the end of the day, we don't have fine print, uh, but the alternatives oftentimes do. And so when they've been burned, they tend to come back to be the best customers that we've ever had, because yeah. they realize that we were honest with them from the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me, I mean, we could talk to you all day long and I, and I've really enjoyed our conversation and I hope you'll come back and continue the conversation in the meantime, where can people learn a little bit more about what you're doing? Well, the, uh, thanks, um, Michael and Jay. I appreciate you both having me on. Uh, they can go to our, our, um, main website, which is the parent company website, mime corp, M I M E corp.com this is just a placeholder site we're, we're kind of revisiting all of our sites because up to this point we've been focusing in on execution and not so much on marketing and pr gotcha. and, uh, so now we're kind of moving in the phase where we kind of need to let people know what we're actually doing so at that site um, mimecorp.com they will then be able to see links to all of our other operating businesses heavy hitters music group beat root which is our distribution distribution business, Mime Records, um, for you recording. All of those websites are linked to that, that landing page at Mime. Gotcha. Excellent. Gotcha. So great. Thank you so, so much, Tony. This, 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 yeah, this was great. It, you know, it's a conversation that has to be had. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge working in the corporate world. And, and let's be honest, the music business is a corporate world. That's right. That's right. Can I just say one last thing before? We sure, of course. course. And it, it kind of speaks to um, some of the things we've all been we're talking about today and, and just the commitment because it is a corporate world and we were thriving. The industry was thriving. And then this pandemic hit and we made a commitment to our people uh, during this pandemic that we weren't going to lay anybody off. And it was painful for a lot of people because during this period of time, um, when touring dried up for the artists, uh, that um, production dried up. So there was not a lot of product in post-production for our sync business. Uh, there were, the, people weren't moving around for writing sessions for uh, our producers who were signed uh, to us for, for, um, for, uh, for our uh, publishing. And so if you kind of think about it, all of our businesses were hit. But we made a commitment to the people because we understood, yeah, we understand the bottom line. We understand the financial impact because this is a business. Right. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to make a commitment to people uh, because when you make commitment to people, when things turn back around, people remember you. Oh, yeah. And so right. it's the same commitment sure we do. make to our, our employees that we're also making to the creatives that work with us. We're committed to you. And it's about doing the right thing by you, uh, regardless of what the economic circumstances and situations are. And so yeah. I agree with you wholeheartedly, Michael. It is a, it's corporate. And we have to try to find a way to do corporate things while at the same time have social responsibility. Exactly. Amen. Amen. I, I applaud awesome. that. That's great. Well, Tony, thank, thank you so much, man. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Best of luck to you. Continue take, to take success. care and, 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 and keep us updated on, on how things are, are going forward. Please. for Lyme. We'll do. Yeah. We'll definitely do that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care. Right. Discmakers.com. Use code FREEBIZ for ground shipping on CD orders of 100 units or more, $150 value. That was such a great conversation with Tony. Um, yeah, you know, I it's, really like that a lot. it's something that I, I, I'm sure you're the same way. I've lived a lot of what we've talked about there, the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's the sort of stuff, first and foremost, it's the sort of stuff where made me go, I want my own business. I don't want to work for people. I don't want to play politics. I don't want to be, have my talent overlooked because 
the CEO's son is got the position above me just because he's got seen son. that movie. Yeah, yeah. We, we've we've yeah. all been there, and uh, you know, it's it's just I said it. It's so great when you find a company and a, and and executives who don't play politics because I I've been in those companies where you'd spend half your day covering your butt because who's going to come out and try and steal your thunder? Who's going to try yeah. and steal your job? Yeah. How are you being productive if you're worried about job security half the day? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it was just such a breath of fresh air. And a lot of what he's talking about, it just needs to be talked about more. And yeah. um, I, I'm thrilled. I, I thought he was a great guest and really provided some really good insights and uh, how we can uh, catch Definitely. back up with him. Um, so one last time, a quick shout out to HypeBot and Bands in Town. Thank you so much for everything you do to support the Music Biz Weekly podcast. And of course, Bandzoogle.com and DiscMakers.com. Thank you for your continued sponsorship. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, if you are watching us or listening to us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, Spotify, mm -hmm. follow us, iTunes, subscribe and leave a review and a rating. It would be appreciate it. Appreciated. Yep. So that's it. Music Biz Weekly Podcast. We're out of here until next week.